goes back a while, I would say. About 20 years. About 20 years. Maybe not something to crow about, but. Uh, and so I've been heavily involved in open source and the internet. I've been involved in uh, starting something called the Linux Professional Institute, uh, which is actually where I'm, what I'm going to be doing shortly. Uh, and I can talk about that later, but that's not why I'm here right now. Uh, essentially, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the last two years uh, of what I was doing, where uh, I acted as Community Technology Access Coordinator for the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR. And so this is a variation of a, of a presentation that I did before. Uh, there's one or two videos in here. Uh, one has been outdated, and I'll talk about it a little bit, but it will still give you some political context into the world in which I was working. Uh, there is going to be some, uh, there's going to be some Linux relevance at the end, but uh, a lot of the challenges are basic infrastructure, and so I'll talk a little bit about what I hope to have brought there through the two-year contract that I had, and talk about some of the issues that they're, one, that they're working with, the challenges that they're facing. Okay, so uh, I started the, at the UNHCR in 2015. Uh, as actually was working for them in Toronto for a little bit before that. Uh, I moved to Geneva, so I actually kept my house in Toronto and had a flat of my own uh, in Switzerland. Um, now, the scope of the uh, UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, that's the name of the agency, uh, it has a worldwide scope, and the only area that it doesn't cover of refugees is the area around Palestine, meaning Israel and the surrounding areas where there are refugee camps in Jordan and Lebanon. Uh, anyone have a stab at why the UN Refugee Agency doesn't cover that? It's handled by a separate UN agency. Because the, um, the Arab refugee industry is far too large and profitable to permit the uh, rest of them to, to uh, horny. Well, arguably, they're all large and profitable. but. Uh, the reason why the, this one was is because the Palestinian Refugee Agency predates UN activity in refugee affairs by some time. So it actually established a commission specifically in the Palestine area and then essentially created another refugee issue to deal with everything that was happening everywhere else in the world. So um, the main function of this agency is protection. Everything else is secondary. So in other words, Somebody is running away from another country to get away from some kind of persecution. It could be physical persecution, it could be war, it could be they're in danger because of their race, their ethnicity, their, uh, uh, their religion, uh, there's, you know, their, there's their choice of friends, their sexual preference. There's a number of different reasons, but it essentially means somebody is leaving and trying to go to another country and fleeing because of a situation that's either temporary or permanent in the country that they're running away from. And so, uh, so shelter obviously is the first one. Education basically means, you know, if somebody's running and they have kids, those kids still need education. Uh, assistance, that can be in the form of food, that can be in the form of cash, that can be in the form of anything that will help people survive and get back on their feet to whatever happens to them next. And so, just in case you weren't sure how many people we're dealing with, about 60 million people right now are on the run somewhere in the world from some other situation, of which more than half are under 18. Uh, also, I wanted, to call into, uh, I wanted to call into attention the fact that everyone's mind right now is on Syria. In terms of acute issues and what's in the news right now, all the attention is there. That's not where most of the refugees are. There's, there's differences in circumstance because of financial status, because of all sorts of things. But uh, most, I had very little to do with the Syrian crisis. I was, in fact, dealing with other parts of it. So as I was saying a, uh, a little earlier, I was in what's called the livelihoods unit. 
And so the focus of this place is to get people employable activity, or shall I say, income revenue, income producing opportunity. And I say that because employment wasn't an easy thing to come by. There's only one country in the world that I came across that legally gives refugees the right to work. And I don't mean places like Canada, which is the final destination, but I mean a transit country where somebody is staying while they're trying to get somewhere else. That country is Uganda. Every other country on earth where refugees are, their host doesn't want them there. They want them out as fast as possible. And something like the right to work, uh, trying to fight for that politically, in some cases, is a non-starter. Because someone is given the right to work, Heavens, they might even become part of the local economy, they might even want an incentive to stay. That just isn't desired for so many reasons. So, resilience is the term that they use. So, the idea of giving somebody an income either through employment in the rare areas where that's possible and more often in areas where people are going into work for themselves. Um, there was an energy department there. There's an agriculture thing. Obviously, one of the best ways that you can either sustain yourself or create something for sale, grow something, which was the easiest thing to do in some places. Um, artisan work was another thing. So somebody is making clothes, they're making leather goods, they're making, uh, they're making small furniture or anything that's for sale in local markets. That's an income producer. And so you had people that were in these various areas of expertise try and help build that kind of resiliency, both as short-term income, but also as longer-term skills and education that could then go with the refugees wherever they ended up. So my role uh, was literally running what was called the Community Technology Access Center. And this started off with Microsoft and HP coming quite some time ago and saying, we'd like to put some computers into refugee centers. So they put some computers into refugee centers and they put some licenses for Windows and Word and gave about four weeks of training to say, okay, everyone's technology literate, our work is done, we can go home. Uh, and in fact, some of this was pre-internet so in other words, you now have this computer center that's pretty well cut off from other parts of the world where you have people that are fairly proficient on using Microsoft Word and Excel and Outlook and things like that. With what? For whom? To what end? Yeah. Oh, thought you had your hand up. Okay. No worries. Okay. And so it started as this network of PC centers. But uh, hopefully I brought a skill set into the job that allowed the job description to change. And so it recognized the fact that the internet is out there. It recognized the fact that there are new capabilities, new responsibilities, and new issues that come up because of the internet. And so how do we make that work? And so first phase is get the infrastructure ready. Make it so that people have the mechanics, both the hardware and the connectivity to be able to talk to the outside world. Secondly, uh, the content. So, all right, you're connected to the internet, now what? Right? What kind of services are available? Remembering, of course, that connectivity, when it exists, is extremely slow. Remembering that most of the people that are there in the camps um, have neither English nor French nor Spanish nor German as their primary language. And so finding appropriate content also becomes a challenge. And then lastly, the issue is, can we use the internet to find people work? Okay, so I will uh, um, talk a little bit about where I spent a good chunk of my time, which is the Dadaab refugee camp. And it is right here on the border between Kenya and Somalia. And so that is possibly one of the largest, if not the largest, refugee camp in the world. When people talk about Syrian refugees coming in the thousands, 
you basically have a place with a population of 365,000 people. Um, any guess what the average stay is in this place? From the time somebody comes to the time somebody either goes home, gets to another country, or integrates locally. Any guess how long? Several years? Five years? Six months? 19 years. You basically have teenagers that have lived their entire lives in this camp. So, um, I have two YouTube videos, one of which is me sitting in the back seat of an armored SUV, the exact kind of uh, stereotype you would expect. Green, a white Range Rover with blue lettering and the big honking antenna on the front, exactly as you expect, except this is all bulletproof. The doors are heavy, the windows are thick as crap and don't go down, and let's just say the shocks are not particularly good. And uh, you may see, I'm trying to pan around, and you will see in front of, in front of our car another Jeep that's going ahead of us with six nice, very nice young men, each of which equipped with submachine guns, and they were there for me. And it was a very creepy feeling. <laughs> um, the waviness of that is Google's attempt to compensate for my own, there's not much sound here. Okay, anyway, uh, it's the sound of the car going through very, very bumpy terrain. Uh, so essentially, most of the Dadaab camp is like this. Every now and then you'll come across uh, some settlements where they're, and it's just all this, and you'll see people walking along with basically standing around. There's not a whole lot to do there. You get there, you survive, you exist, and you wait to be able to get out of there. Uh, and so uh, you'll see in a second this big honking mass of solar panels, which essentially was the on only source of electricity for the entire place. But effectively, this is what the camps are like. 300,000 people, basically the population of Brampton in a circumstance like that. Uh, I don't, I, I wouldn't have, I mean, I could obviously look up numbers. I just remember it being massive. So that bank of, that bank of uh, solar cells basically was the entire source of electricity to the place. And yeah, there you can see the Jeep ahead, and that was, and that's basically getting from, to get to this place is basically going into Nairobi, going to the international airport, going to the little airport, getting onto a vintage Dash 8, sorry, uh, yeah, vintage Dash 8, and I don't mean the new quiet ones, I mean the original Dash 8s um, run by the World Food Program. They have their own little airline and they will occasionally go out from Nairobi to not just this one, but a number of the other camps. And, uh, and then from there, you have, a long trip and you have a long trip into the camp. Uh, sorry? Oh, I see. It looks like Saskatchewan with sand. <laughs> I think you would rather Saskatchewan. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now this is, okay, so essentially what that clip was talking about is the Kenyan government's attempt to take that settlement of 365,000 odd people and just shut it down. Basically force people back into Somalia, kick them out of Kenya. Um, there are some legitimate grievances. Uh, there were, there are Somali refugees that have been anti-West. Uh, if you've heard of the group El Shabab, El Shabab is from that route that I was traveling. El Shabab was within 20 kilometers, and that is why I was in the uh, reinforced glass SUV. Yes. 
In this particular camp, it's right on the border between Kenya and Somalia. So the bulk is from Somalia. So right now, Somalia is pretty well a failed state. It doesn't have a very good functioning government. Uh, and so you have a number of warring tribes, including a very, uh, uh, a very big presence from a group called Al-Shabaab, which is an Islamist group that has been very, very anti-West. Uh, you may remember Somalia was also the source of a lot of the piracy that was happening uh, in, in, uh, in the Indian Ocean, and that only got st basically stopped by military force on the behalf of, you know, navies of various countries. It wasn't because Somalia decided to be nice, it was because uh, the other countries that were protecting the shipping lanes were, were protecting themselves. But essentially, uh, this, now, this particular camp is next to the Somali border. Uh, there is another camp in Kenya uh, that, it, that was next to the border of uh, South Sudan. And so there was recently a very significant conflict between, uh, within Sudan, uh, a country that broke away called South Sudan. Those two countries still don't get along with each other. And the fighting and the deaths that resulted from that also have, involved, uh, have led to a number of refugees coming across the border. And Kenya has been seen as a reasonable site for them to end up. But what's happened is, as, the, as you might have heard on the clip, Kenya has paid a price. They have had some attacks. There was a shopping mall attempt in Kenya where basically you had gunmen take over, uh, take over a shopping mall, um, ask people to read the Quran, and if they couldn't, they shot them. Uh, now, this happened a couple of years ago. But it's now very secure. You go in Nairobi, and there are uh, dogs, sniffer dogs, at the entrance of, of uh, most major buildings, basically metal detectors at the entrance of just about every office building. So, I mean, they've taken some steps. Uh, the locals blame Somalis on causing this. Uh, there is a neighborhood of, of Nairobi uh, that's mainly Somali, and a lot of people are scared of it. And so there's an awful lot of political tension. I can't say I don't at all, I can't say I totally fault the government for saying we didn't bring this upon ourselves and yet we're not getting any help. So they're hosting these massive refugee camps. In some cases, some of the world agencies have been cutting back the funds to help pay for this. So who pays for this? Kenya does. And so the update on this is as of a week ago, you may or may not have heard, but there's actually a court within Kenya that basically said that the government could not close this camp down. It's still being fought, at, but now it's at the court level. So you have a superior court within Kenya saying government can't close it down. Government's saying we're still determined to do it. So even as even given the situation things are, things are in, uh, you still have, you know, 300, more than 350,000 people that are basically sort of, well, the government says, get them out, and everyone's saying, please keep them, and it's this massive political game going on. So this is a little bit of a description of the problems that I ran into um, while I was doing my work. So as I was saying, there's only one country for which, uh, for which there's an entitlement to work. So one of the things that we actually considered was, um, how can you take a computer center like this? This is actually run by a Catholic charity. Um, if, you, if you're Catholic, uh, that's the portrait of someone named Don Bosco. And so there's a, a Catholic charity called Don Bosco, and they actually operate a number of centers like this that are in refugee camps providing internet access. That's why I'm saying I'm not Catholic, but clearly this fellow is <laughs> okay. But so, and so this is also an area at a camp in Uganda. There's a computer center back there, and basically everything is on wide open grounds. One thing there is no shortage of is space, but 
being able to put buildings on the space has become a challenge. So there's right to work skills. I say there's local hostility, which sort of you got a taste of with the, the, the stress between the Kenyan government and the refugee camp. Language issues, of course, where you have the aid workers that are coming in from Europe and North America. Nobody speaks Somali, nobody speaks Swahili. So you have that, you have that as an issue. Very high unemployment, nobody has a right to work. So there's a local economy inside the camp. If you can run a restaurant, if you can fix a cell phone, if you can fix an engine, there's certain amounts of work to be done. Uh, but every now and then you have people that have, again, well, that are well-meaning, that are trying to do good things, that do things that just sometimes totally bog the mind, boggle the mind. When I got to this camp in um, Naka Valley, which is in Kenya, that has refugees from all over, that has from uh, the Congo, which is going through some, some political upheaval, to all sorts of other areas in the region. And I was going down there, and my first trip was to this place, and somebody was doing a training course for videography. And they had 40 people in the class, and they were teaching them videography skills. They had, you know, cameras that they brought down with them, and they were teaching these skills. And this is all very nice until the teachers pack up and go home. What then? Now you have 40 videographers, and how much work do you think there is for videography? Okay, now, to be sure, there are some people that have weddings or christenings or other things going on that they do want to be re re recorded. You have, you know, documentary makers that are saying, I need local footage. There is some work, maybe for one person. So now you have 40 people fighting after one person's worth of work. So you have a group of 40 people that maybe once upon a time were friends or at least got along with each other and now they're fighting over they're now they're fighting over jobs so you had something that was incredibly well intentioned that had unforeseen consequences and so i use this as an example of the kind of thing that you have to watch out for you can go down there and you say i want to do good things but you have to be really really conscious about unintended consequences because they're all over okay so, do I have that? All right. So, this basically goes into some of the approaches I personally was trying to take. Okay, I've talked about the problems. Now, what did we do to try and fix that? And one of them was telework. So, this was an area where I could go in and apply some ICT skills to try and generate income opportunities for people using the tech. So, when you think of telework, what do you think of? Anyone? Remote Sorry? Remote, remote working. So, remote working runs the entire gamut from a company like Tata contracting to a bank in Canada to basically do all sorts of IT things. So, at a very high level, that's telework. You have people in another country that are doing work for a country, uh, uh, for another company where you have people who the original contractor has never met, they're working halfway around the world, but they're doing employable work. So that's one form of it. Yes? I, information and communications technology. It's basically the evolution of IT. And so that's the term everyone uses because now they've added the internet into it, so it's not just information tech, it's now information and communications tech, so anywhere where you've seen IT, it's being commonly replaced by ICT right now. It's my, coming up with finding acronyms, weird acronyms all over the UN is not hard to come by. But that's one of the more common ones. Okay, so, but telework is also at a very micro level. Has anyone heard of Amazon Mechanical Turk? Okay, Amazon Mechanical Turk is at the other end of the spectrum where you do micro work, tiny pieces of work that might pay you a few cents each, but if you do enough of them in the course of a week, that might be a passable income. Not for somebody in North America, but certainly for somebody in a developing world economy. 
So there's other sites. Another one is called Fiverr. And there's a whole bunch of small job matching sites. Could, you, basic, could you give an example of the kind of the, the, the mechanical Turk uh, work that someone would do? Translate this paragraph. Translate this paragraph. Or here's a photo. Tag it with some metadata. Is it a dog? Is it outside? So telework could be something as much as, and I worked on a, on a photo tagging project because that was a biggie. So photo tagging was, here's a bunch of digital photos. Basically put in some keywords of what each of these is about. They can't really, you know, Google can get only so far in saying this is a dog and it can do the obvious ones, but there's a lot of non-obvious stuff that a human eye can get to and be able to tag that isn't quite machine doable yet. So photo tagging is a common one. Translation, transcription, hear a speech, type it down. That's another one. So photography work, translation, transcription, uh, a lot of kind of data massaging. That's, that was also very common. Uh, I actually won a contest from the World Bank to try and do a project that would take PDFs and make them accessible to the disabled. So right now you run a PDF through a PDF reader and well, if you're sighted, well, great for you. If you're not sighted, there's not a lot of information in PDFs right now that make them work well with readers for the blind. So I was actually developing a program together with uh, the ITU, the International Telecom Union, which is the United Nations Telecommunications Agency. They do all the work between the telcos. And together with the organization that had designed the tech to do this, which was OCAD University in Toronto. Out of all the places, they have advanced the technology of doing document conversion for the disabled, possibly better than just about anywhere in the world. And so we had this program that was going to get refugees to use these tools on the systems they had to be able to convert PDFs so that they would be so that they would be usable by the disabled. The reasons why it didn't work so far were more administrative than technical. There were a lot of moving parts going on on this as you can imagine three different agencies how do you, who's going to pay for it who's going to manage it and so as of right now, the project is, was suspended at the time that I left, possibly because it was just a matter of getting the right business models in place. But that's an example of the kind of work, right? A digital, digital conversions, whether it's photo tagging, whether it's transcription, that was the kind of work they were talking about. But that could take other forms. So you go to a website like Fiverr. Fiverr says, what can somebody do for me for $5? And so you go onto that site and say, I'll create you a logo for your business, or I'll do this, or I'll create you stationery, or I'll do this, or I'll design, I'll make you a video, or something like that. So there's, you know, that's what telework is. You're here, they're there, what can they do for you that doesn't require them to be physically present, that they can do it by remote access? I, I, did that, that answer your question? Okay. Um, so at, the, so at the macro level, you have the Tatas and the very, very big business process outsourcing. So that's also an example of telework, but it's very large scale. And then the smallest area was Amazon Mechanical Turk. Problem is, tried talking to Amazon, didn't get very far. Because at a certain point, how do you get paid? So here you are here, there they are there, they've done the work, you're happy with them, how do you pay them? Oh, by the way, did I say? They didn't have a bank account, let alone the right to work. So how do you get, how do you get paid? That's also a massive obstacle here. Uh, and so one of the things we ended up coming up with is very dependent country to country. Um, is anyone familiar with the concept of mobile money? Mobile money is your cell phone is actually like a mini bank. And you accumulate credits, and you can pass credits to and from other people, and that becomes like a currency. You can go into a place and prepay and get a card, punch in the credits. All of a sudden, now you have this currency in your bank, which you can then go to a supermarket, and the supermarket has above the cashier their number. You type in the number, 
you've paid for your groceries in real time. Now, right now, that is in very, very high use in Kenya from a company called uh, Safaricom, which is owned by Vodafone, and they have a very, very well, well, well working mobile money system there that they are now trying to expand to other countries. If you want to pay someone in Kenya, even in a refugee camp, so long as they own a cell phone, and most of them do, so long as they own a cell phone, there is a PayPal competitor that will talk to the mobile money system. So you say, I want to go, the PayPal competitor is called Skrill. You go to Skrill, you say, I want to pay Skrill. Skrill then contacts the mobile money and inserts credits into the account of the person you're talking to. No bank involved. This is the kind of obstacle you're working with when people don't have access, like I say, even to, to, to the banking system, to right to work, and so this becomes a really big challenge. Um, now, this now gets me finally into my relevance into this room. <laughs> and this is, okay, there's a certain limit to some, what somebody can do within the camp. One of the things we're also trying to do is prepare people, prepare people for something they could do when they got out, with the anticipation that even though some people are there for 19 years, at least some of the population is going to get what's called uh, you know, a, a, a durable solution, which was the buzzword in the UN for somebody safely getting what they wanted, which was one of three things. Either to go back to the country that gave you the problems in the first place, or to integrate with where you are, or to find another country to get to. The first one might be in use, for instance, in Somalia. Somalia just recently elected a new president. If the country stabilizes, a lot of the people that are in the refugee camps will voluntarily want to go back. They didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave, get out of there. They've got family. They've got houses. They've got things that they left behind. Not everybody that's a refugee wants to come to Australia or Canada or Sweden or whatever. Most left something behind that they'd like to go back to if given the choice. And in fact, in one of my first slides, this poster was all over the place. And it was basically saying, return by choice. So in other words, if you want to go back to Somalia, by all means do, and we will help you. And the country of Kenya will help you, but nobody's forcing you to do it. You have a right not to go back. But for some people, this is an option. Going back is an option. And in the Syrian context, why do you think people from Syria are dying on boats going across the Mediterranean? Syria isn't on the south side of the Mediterranean. Why are people dying on boats doing that? Any guesses? Because a lot of the people that are doing that had the money to fly to Egypt, fly to Morocco. The Syrian refugee crisis is a middle class crisis. The people that were leaving are skilled, had some money, and we're hoping to weather the storm, shall we say, in a place like Egypt or Morocco or Tunisia, and then head back when things calm down. Here we are. Years have passed. Nothing has calmed down. Things have gotten worse. Chances are where they fled from has been destroyed. Chances are family that they have left behind has either been killed or dispersed otherwise. What's to go back to? The money's running out. But next, all of a sudden the traffickers are starting to look good and they're very heavily advertising. And so that's why, for instance, I did some work in Alexandria, Egypt. And they had two different groups of refugees. One was Syrians. What are the Syrians doing in Alexandria? They're doing that because they were trying to have a place to stay for a while. There's no camps in Egypt. So you had Syrians that were staying in, uh, in Alexandria and Cairo hoping to go back. They didn't, they, they didn't want to have to go to Canada or wherever. They preferred 
Now, I can't speak for everyone, but I'm saying by and large, Syrians would have preferred to go back to Syria. Right now, there's very little to go back to. So that country needs to do rebuilding. But once Syria is rebuilt, an awful lot of the people that came as refugees will probably want to go back home. That's their home. So this ended up being, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's extremely complicated to deal with. But going back to the computer part and the IT part, and this is where I was able to tap into work that I had done with Linux Professional Institute, which I had started a decade ago and is now doing okay for itself as a certification body. There is a training company called NDG, which offers a nearly low cost program of introduction to Linux. It's targeted at the LPI certification. And so Cisco is actually, I, I, I set up a relationship between Cisco and the Alexandria Computer Center to try and do training in Linux for free. And now I'm going to work with LPI to see if they can do certification testing there for free or near free. With the intention that uh, I can't necessarily help people get a job in a place where they don't have a right to work but eventually they will get out of there. When they get out of there, they're gonna need some skills to set up where they are. And so um, the use of Linux was, made it a lot easier to work with. Cisco has been a great partner. Cisco Networking Academy is different from the commercial Cisco training system. They will still train someone towards their CCNA, CCNE certifications the difference is the networking academy is done by academic organizations and NGOs, and the commercial stuff is done by commercial training centers. So Cisco has these two parallel things. They don't teach all of the same identical things, but they will both do Cisco certification, and the, and the NGO slash academic part of Cisco is also doing Linux and LPI training. And that's where they're focusing. So it's actually some really nice things that they're doing there. Uh, and going off slides a bit, uh, one of the things that I was finding was for choice of the hardware. When somebody's sitting down at a screen and trying to get to the internet, so what hardware do they use? Well, that HP and Microsoft stuff that was dropped on their desks X number of years ago, it's not going to be able to run Windows 10. And so a lot of this stuff is going to need replacement tooling, whatever. And so one of the things that I was trying to advance there, and I think I succeeded, was the concept of little units like a Raspberry Pi, especially with the Model 3, have the power to be able to be a really, really nice little internet client. Basically, you stick a keyboard, a screen, and your network, and you're good to go. And no, it doesn't run Windows, but that's not what people need to do there. And if you think about what's happened to the cloud now, you need to make a slideshow. You don't need Windows, <laughs> right? You need to make documents. You don't need Windows. You need to converse with other people. Well, uh, most of what people are doing the internet for are, are two apps. Skype? No. Facebook. <laughs> Facebook, what's the other? Instagram. No. What's that? Facebook and WhatsApp are basically 90% of internet use there. And until now, penetration of chocolate bar phones, self uh, feature phones, is about more than 90%. Most people have that. And in fact, that's been a really, really good communications tool all on its own because um, UNICEF has created this really good SMS blast software. So if there is a weather storm happening somewhere, or if there is a disease outbreak happening somewhere, or if there's a crime alert in your area. They basically have enough of a database that they could do an SMS blast out to a neighborhood at a neighborhood level. And it's been a really, really good communication tool to the point where they've been able to do a menuing system. So they send out an SMS, answer one for this, two for this, three for this. And in fact, that's been used for medical purposes. So somebody sends a message in, my kid is sick. 
and you're using this very SMS menu, very, very dead simple system, they've been able to get to a lot of basic medical, uh, medical support in a way that they couldn't do certainly in person. And of course, we're talking a lot of places where, where smartphones aren't common. But smartphones are becoming more common. Right now, uh, based on some of the statistics that have been done recently, internet access is now the third most requested thing, the third, third most needed thing after, uh, after food and shelter. To the point where people are needing to find out, first of all, what's the situation back home? How are my friends and family doing and where are they? That stuff is critical. And also, what are my rights? What do I do next? Where do I go? What can I do? Finding truthful information. How do I get to Germany in a way that doesn't put you in the hands of a, of a human trafficker? Is that ends up being a very critical thing. Both of those elements, not only being able to answer the question, but do it in a way where you're trying to separate, you know, you're thinking false news, you have people that are in the trafficking industry that have been gaming the search engines and getting into SEO and all that. So when you're searching, how do I get to how do I get to Germany or France or whatever? And they get put they get sent to something that looks official and ends up that they're talking to a smuggler. So there's a, a, an ongoing battle, uh, but at least uh, where the computer access is happening. It looks like at least in a couple of the sites where I was involved, uh, the Windows systems are getting replaced with Raspberry Pi 3s. Uh, and, uh, and they're realizing, for instance, that having to go Windows was not necessarily the best thing for a couple of reasons. One of and the most critical of which is power. Do you think of what it takes for the tube to run a desktop PC? 450 watts or something like that, right? Think of what it takes to power a Raspberry Pi. It's a USB, what, one watt, maybe two? And so in a place where electricity is as precious as the supply as anything else, forget all the other hardware costs. The power costs are phenomenally less using these small units than having to go with regular desktops. Even in the schemes where they were using one desktop in, uh, CPU to power two or three screens, this still works out better. And now with things like the level three Raspberry Pi, it's got all the power they need to do most things on the net. Uh, and so between the training that's happening towards Linux and I think the move that's happening towards these small systems, most of which are running Linux, uh, and the fact that when people are going for smartphones, nobody's buying iPads there. <laughs> uh, in the Dadaab camp, I went into the market. Well, I didn't go in the market. Somebody went into the market on my behalf. Uh, the security people said that if they let me into the market, they would lose their jobs the next day. <laughs> so uh, they, somebody went into the market on my behalf and went to buy an Android phone. What would it cost to buy a fully current, working, good Android phone on the, in the markets there. Any guesses? $50? 55 So as you're looking at your pixels and your galaxies and your G5s and G6s, uh, you can get a fully working, current Android phone in the markets, not only of the dog, but in a lot of the developing world now. This is, for, where, this is for the color display and the, oh yeah. This yeah. is this is this color is display, design. touch screen, capacitive. This is this is capable of running fifty five dollars. Yeah. Now it's not a brand that you would real. It's not a well, brand. You would it's Chinese. It's a Chinese brand, and in fact, it's a Chinese brand that specializes in marketing into Africa. That's uh, yeah. The uh, in fact, if some if you, the brand is called Techno T E C N O. And it's a Chinese brand, and all they do is market to Africa. Uh, and so they specialize. And it's an absolutely no frills phone. So by your standards, it's got less memory than you want, and it's probably not got the fastest Snapdragon or what. It's capable of doing the job. 
It won't run 18 apps at once because most of most people are only running three or four. But it'll run Facebook, especially the chopped down version of Facebook that Facebook makes available in the developing world. There's a Facebook Lite that you cannot get here, that is being that is uh, that is uh, available elsewhere in the world. Do you know? Are you aware of it? Like, um, I mean. Honestly, the people out there, they don't use that. They use Facebook, but what they really care about is WhatsApp. My experience was it was both. Because Facebook is, Facebook is where you find your friends. Where is my family? So there's a lot of where is my family and where is, where is my community in Toronto or Adelaide or wherever it is I want to go. I want to link up with them. Facebook was critical for that. WhatsApp was one on one, but for group participation, it was Facebook. One of the things I encountered when coming into the UN is they'd already done a Facebook for refugees. They were spending a stupid amount of money on it. One of my greatest accomplishments was stopping that. <laughs> there is a Facebook for refugees. It's called Facebook. <laughs> oh, this is something they were treating as Facebook for refugees. Yes, we've created this new portal, a Facebook for refugees, and people can talk to each other on it. <laughs> there is a Facebook for refugees. It's called Facebook. <laughs> and so, anyway, long story. But it has, it has a happy ending in that the UN is now saving some money, thanks to me. So I take more pride in, unfortunately, what I stopped is as important as what I started. But sometimes that can be just it. And stopping people from spending stupid money is, can sometimes be an accomplishment in itself. And by that nerd stick, I did very well. <laughs> uh, but also, in creating some telework opportunities by doing that stuff with the World Bank and OCAD University and opening, and opening the door to being a, a, getting refugees being able to do this, it's a very, very long slog. The reason why I couldn't work with Amazon Mechanical Turk had to go back to how do we pay people. Amazon said we're more than happy to have them work. They were only prepared to pay in Amazon, Amazon gift cards. Not only that, but not even a physical card. If it was a physical card, you could trade that as a commodity. But no, you had to have an Amazon account. If you were the worker, they would credit your account and it was non-transferable. And guess what? If you're sitting in a refugee camp on the Somali-Kenya border, the amount of things you need to get from Amazon is not very big. Not to mention the fact that there's that sort of transportation issue. <laughs> Delivery to the, the drones don't have that range. <laughs> Actually, the drones are used for other purposes. <laughs> yes. So I, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, you mentioned them earlier as problems, and how do, what's the physical uh, mechanism by which these computers are networked on the, in the camps? I mean, is there is okay. a cell phone network that transports this? There is an increasing use of mesh network within the camp to try and get connectivity. So the moment one place has connectivity, a wide range has connectivity. They're still sharing that one signal, but at least it has a breadth, and there's a growing use of mesh and similar technologies to be able to enable that. But essentially what will happen is you will have a phone company, and they will bring in like the one tower to the edge of the camp, and like everybody's got to share that. And so there is definitely a challenge about connectivity for refugees. And so you have different companies that are trying different approaches. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that was a bit of a setback is late last year, uh, a Facebook satellite exploded on the rocket that was supposed to go up. I don't know if you heard of it. Facebook actually tried launching a satellite, a connectivity satellite, and it exploded. And as a result, their connectivity efforts have been set back significantly. Now, Facebook's efforts are not without controversy. Uh, if you've heard about uh, internet.org, uh, then you know about the fact that Facebook has tried to do certain versions of cheap or free internet in very parts of the world. In some places like Tanzania, they've been accepted. In some places like India, they've been rebuffed. 
It's a very controversial thing. They've recently put, brought uh, a head of their connectivity section, a fellow by the name of Pepper. They brought him from Cisco. Um, I see really good things. I'm not generally a fan of Facebook as a company, but they brought in some really good people, and I think there's some really good potential. And then you have Google. Anyone know what Google wants to do for connectivity in Africa? Balloons. 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 And how would you like it if you were an African government and this American company was launching communications balloons above your land? Well, weren't they starting in Brazil originally? Uh, I'm not sure if they've been testing them in Brazil. That's definitely the stated intent, but it's like the local governments haven't sort of all got the telegram yet. Um, not to mention the fact, if you've been listening to the news, an increasing number of governments have been t shutting down the internet as a way to stifle dissent when there's been protest. This has been happening in Turkey, this has been happening in various countries in Africa. And so if you are one of these kinds of governments, and all of a sudden there's this sort of Google balloon flying above the country doing anything it wants, yeah, that's what the drones are for. <laughs> uh, so I'm just saying, it's, it's, it's a very tense environment. You have a lot of Silicon Valley saying we'd like to do really good things, and you have a lot of the recipient government saying, you know, how about asking us first? So there's some very interesting dynamics, and that's even before you get into refugee issues, because you have very remote parts of, of, of the developing world, not even refugee camps, where there's really poor connectivity, like Barry. <laughs> My other question, you mentioned the language barrier. Yes. Are the people operating ESL schools in, uh, in the camps, or what um, is the solution? There, well, okay, there, you have to be careful with that, because ESL, in some cases, is very useful, and in some cases, is very colonial. So, I mean, plan A is to allow people to work in their own language in the way they want, and that means having content in their language, which means facilitating the creation of content. So if somebody's first access to the internet is something like Facebook, internet.org, or something like that that's mainly English, that's not something you necessarily want to do to a local population if you have, you know, if you have their best if you, if you, you know, this is back to unintended consequences. Do you want a backlash because you're trying to force English on them? So this is a very, very uh, careful situation, especially when you have a situation like in Kenya and Uganda where the main language of the country is English and the main language of the refugees is not. That's a source of friction. And saying, well, okay, but first you've got to learn English is might be an answer, but it's not always the best. You said you had two questions. Is that both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, okay. that was both. Anything else? Um, so a while back we had uh, a couple of folks from uh, LibreOffice talking about translations of software. Mm -hmm. Was that a project that you looked at while you were out there? Uh, the honest answer is not really. And I think part of that is because there is now such a growing dependence on the cloud, is that people are starting to look at cloud-based solutions instead of standalone software solutions. So if somebody is sitting on a Raspberry Pi, is it going to be easier for them to download LibreOffice, or is it going to be easy for them just to go into Google Docs or uh, assume for a moment that as a, as a matter of development, Microsoft gives away free Office, Office 365 <coughs> licenses or whatever. I'm simply saying at this point, you know, where you have, a, you know, things like Chromebooks becoming, you know, in some cases, the laptops of choice, uh, then you have an increasing turn towards the cloud as opposed to standalone apps. And I think one of the unfortunate uh, victims of that is going to be some of the internationalization efforts for this, is that people would rather go and help a cloud system 
uh, become fully translated before going into the sample and stuff. I can't say that's universally the case, but uh, I know definitely uh, even people that are using Linux systems down there are probably preferring the cloud choices over the standalone productivity apps. Except when you get into things like graphics. So there's no online equivalent to GIMP. Um, follow up question. Uh, shutting down things like Facebook or Refugees could, but is there room for projects like that that focus on cloud utilities like LibreOffice Web Edition? where you could work on the translations? Uh, that's possible. There are a couple of places on the internet where people are genuinely trying to seek out innovations in the use of tech for refugees. In fact, there is a Facebook group called Techfugees that is um, almost a kind of virtual incubator where you have people are bringing forth their ideas and trying to get support for it. Uh, one of the things that I thought was of merit was there is a, a job matching system that somebody is trying to develop that's very, very, you know, refugee development specific in a way of <clears throat> doing like what a fiber or a mechanical Turk would do, but do it in a way where there's challenges in how to get paid and challenges of how do you take a big job and break it up into small pieces and that kind of thing. And so there is development, uh, but I've also become very jaded at the term innovation because uh, Oxford University has a conference for humanitarian innovation and to some of the players it's like I changed my type font, I'm too innovative and it's really, it, it really the, the bounds of what some people call innovation makes the term almost meaningless. Uh, you know, thanks to things like the Facebook for Refugees, the one thing that makes me run screaming are the words, we've created a new platform that dot, 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 which is always the kind of thing that makes you want to run screaming, because chances are somebody's already done it, right? So if somebody's done a Facebook for Refugees, somebody's already done a Facebook. If somebody's already done a, okay, now I'm in Germany, where are the social service agencies? Well, the first one was a really good idea. But the, th the 13 that followed weren't probably quite so useful. So you have a lot of wheel reinvention going on uh, and uh, uh, unfrightening shortage of genuine innovation of how can I use mobile tech to solve problems. Okay. There's a lot of well-meaning, there's a lot of well-meaning people out there, uh, just not a lot of creativity. <laughs> people who think that other people have the same problems that they do. And, and it's really difficult for a student or even a social entrepreneur in North America or in, in Europe to try and think, what are the problems of refugees and how can I fix things? And it's very often well-meaning, very often benevolent, and very often useless. They haven't got hyenas trying to steal their shoes. Just to add to what you said, not just for refugees, but just about anywhere in the developing world. It's, it, it extends to just about everywhere in the developing world. Is that you have people saying, you know, oh, look at the great things we're doing for you, when not only is it sometimes useless and sometimes it has negative yeah. unintended consequences, like having 39 videographers that hate each other that once upon a time didn't. <laughs>